A principle in communication says, give it to them and let them know that you give it to them. That is to say that if you do something for someone, you let them know you did it for them. For political parties, they want to make noise about anything they do, whether in opposition or in government, especially when they are in government. Now, the political party, when it becomes a government, loses a lot of command because the government takes a new life, political party on the side. Yet, the party is the one that bears the government. And that party has to communicate the successes of the government so that that party remains in government. My guest on Face to Face today is a man whose job it is to communicate for that party, project the party and say that this party in government is better and please keep us in power. When I come back, I'll introduce him and ask him how difficult that job is. My name is Umaru Sandamado. You're welcome to Face to Face. Yao Buabina Samoa was a member of parliament for the Adenta constituency. He is a lawyer, a politician, he's been involved in a lot of things. He's my guest on Face to Face. Currently, he's a director of communication of the New Patriotic Party. You're welcome to Face to Face. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Did I get all your titles right or there's something I've missed out? I've mentioned politician, uh, or does it, politician, lawyer. That, um, the civil society, public service, but it's sufficient. You do civil society? <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, the anti-corruption movement. Oh, partisan uh, anti-society? Uh, so no, I, I used to be involved heavily with the Ghana Integrity Initiative, first executive secretary. The local chapter Ghana of Transparency International? Yes, the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, again, founding executive secretary. Uh, with the which, which, which means to say you stands. founded those? In Ghana? Not by myself. I was founding executive secretary for both organizations in concert with other personalities. Vitus Azim's GII. You are the one who founded it. I mean, as in founding executive. I like that. Vitus Azim's GII. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, Vitus has appropriated well, it. But he has left, so. Yes. But that usually GII. when we hear the GII, it's yes. Vitus. Okay. I was, I you were the founder. You were the, oh. First executive secretary. But you were a politician then. How were you? And you were at the time. Which, which year was this? Uh, 98, 99. Oh, this was when you were fighting Rollins. More or less. Okay. As an, were you active in politics in those days, or you were? I've been active in politics since the setup of the New Patriotic Party. Wow! Wow! Playing the youthful role yes. at the time. I yes. see. I see. And uh, the coordinating council of tertiary institutions, which uh, metamorphosed later into Tescon. Okay. Okay. Yes. So you were there when Tescon was birthed. Well before Tescon. As in like you, you, you yes. witnessed the birthing yes. of Tescon. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. How was the fight against Rollins at the time as students? Uh, today, uh, it's, it's more straightforward, but then uh, it was risky. Guerrilla warfare? It was risky. <laughs> Live ammunition. I can imagine. I can <laughs> Live imagine. ammunition was involved. If, if uh, you remember, uh, some of our demonstrations then, uh, spearheaded by Nukes and the SRCs, uh, sometimes... Ghana Bar Association. And the Ghana Bar Association, all the civil society organizations who wanted a more democratic outlook and, and, and we're driving the processes forward towards consensus on uh, passing a democratic constitution. This is pre-1992 and then into 1992 when the constitution itself was passed uh, and the controversies surrounding the indemnity mm -hmm, clauses. clauses because uh, there were many who felt dissatisfied that the indemnity clauses had been boxed in with the constitution in such a way that you couldn't reject the, the, the clauses and one. keep the constitution. So we had to compromise and take it along. But there were many who felt dissatisfied with the indemnity clauses. 30 years on, they are no more relevant, are they? There are people who still clauses. think they should be removed, but the people for whom they were created are no more. So what's the point? My, my, my view of constitutional development is that it's dynamic. Uh, one can't specifically say that a particular provision uh, dropped would enhance the rest of it if you don't also look at other provisions. Uh, and so for me, now the most critical aspects of that constitution that we need to look at is Article 55. Which one is that? Which is the participation of political parties in local government elections. That botched attempt in 2018. It's, it's still debatable whether it was botched or, or, it, it, or what, it whatever was aborted. happened. Yes, it was aborted, yes. but botched implies that 
uh, somebody didn't do their work well. Yes, somebody didn't do their work but well. Akufado and you, your party, your government, you feel to do a good job. Political consensus building mm. is, is important. Political consensus building is important. Now we are heading towards the area of accommodation. I call it political accommodation, where we are pulled apart. Mm -hmm. And now we realize that there are certain things that we must arrive at as a national interest position. Common ground. Common ground. So that whichever government is in power drives those interests mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is what some say uh, the National Development Planning Commission should develop as a long-term uh, development plan for the country. I disagree with that position. You don't think uh, there should be? No. I, I think the parties in rubbing off each other, engaging as we are doing, will come up with the issues that we need to focus on. Uh, for example, we need to focus on food security. Yes, yeah, but National As, De Development Planning Commission can do that and say that this is our projected plan. Uh, yes, they are, they are an advisory group, but they would stereotype and make it too tight. Based on the admi administration The, the, the plan. structural mm -hmm. uh, way they will operate in and the bureaucratic way they will operate in. Uh, some things are political, but we can arrive at a political accommodation on three or four essentials that we as a nation agree on and that every political party would come in with a program around those issues. Are you not pushing a Unigov agenda? Is that no, what you're doing? Not. I'm not. For example, food security. Mm -hmm. It's not in our interest that we are importing food. When we can actually produce and export organic food and we are still importing food, can we agree that food security for us, food self-sufficiency, is material? And that every government that seeks the mandate of the people ought to have a program, a credible program that the people can interrogate to advance food security. Can we agree that employment is a critical one? And that every government that is coming in must have a program around employment that we can interrogate and compare? Can we agree that infrastructure delivery is critical? Can we agree that social capital development is critical? I mean, investments in human capital, education, health. Can we agree on those things? When it comes to infrastructure, energy, self-sufficiency, sustainability, uh, uh, roads, uh, digitization, can we agree on those things? So that when a government is coming in, a government is fashioning its manifesto, a government is engaging the people and messaging its campaign, it can tell us what it intends to do about those areas. But at what forum can we have this agreement? If the forum is not NDPC, where can that forum be? Oh, because it, is, it cannot be binding. It is evolving. Mm -hmm. It is evolving. <laughs> and and, and uh, at the risk of sounding controversial, uh, surveys that are coming up mm -hmm. keep throwing up those issues, mm -hmm. as issues that matter to the people, mm -hmm. including the very recent uh, yeah, EIU report, issues, yeah. which looked at uh, employment, mm -hmm. infrastructure, human security. Human security. You, you, you understand? Yeah, yeah. Before then, other surveys which looked at parliamentary participation pre the 2020 election looked at the expectations of people who, even though their MPs are not development agents, hard development agents in terms of delivery on those, were expecting their MPs mm. to facilitate employment, to facilitate roads. Yes, utilities in that sense, to facilitate access to education, to facilitate their health needs. In other words, to provide a net, social net for their vulnerabilities. So, so the, the society is gradually coalescing around those issues. And the political parties must work towards, towards those issues. Let me go back to the issue of civil society and how they helped you take on the administration of General Orleans at the time. Mm -hmm. Criticism is that, and you are founder of two of them, Criticism now is that your party in power now has, quote and unquote, bought all the civil society organizations, so they are effectively silent, either silenced by coercion or silenced by corruption. What I, do you say to I that? I wish it were so. Mm. We get heavily bashed. You sure? By, oh, yes. We get heavily bashed as compared by to, civil society. As compared to who or what? It is not about a direct line comparison between regimes. Mm -hmm. It's about the prevailing environment at any point in time. When the MPP is in charge, there's a sense that the boundaries are broader, expectations of freedom are higher, and expectations of output from the government are extremely high. 
In other words, the standards people set the MPP, and perhaps from our posture ourselves and our history, the standards we project and the expectations we give are so high that it's very easy to bash us. Rather. So because these are not easily attained standards. We, we, we seek a certain level of democracy that is extremely open. You know, look at media. Mm -hmm. It is the MPP, the singular stroke of repealing a criminal libel law. That strengthened the media. That strengthened the and media. And it's the same MPP yeah. with a mm -hmm. singular stroke of retaining the, 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 the criminalization of speech that has arrested and detained a lot of people who are engaged yeah. in the social yeah. media space in recent times. In fact, the BBC did a documentary yeah. on Monday yes. which cast a very dark shadow Yes. on the administration's management of press freedom. That it, should be a problem for you. You see, I told you we are being bashed and you disagreed. The BBC <laughs> passed a documentary. Mm -hmm. you know. These things go on. The point I was trying to make is that it is the freedom that has led to that kind of exhibitionism from some of the, the, the people behind the media. But you are curtailing that freedom. Well, it's not. You have to have a balance of responsibility. So, uh, 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 criminal libel is abolished. Yes. Okay. But there are laws on the books for, for preserving reputations mm -hmm. through the police are there. And those laws are executed through the law courts. Old laws that are deemed not progressive enough you are revisited by a party that repealed the criminal Ma libel Ma law. Maru, Maru, you must to look, arrest people for speaking their mind. In fact, there's an argument and criticism that says you are behaving like 1984, where you are criminalizing the thought of a human being. You, you must look at a balance. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like absolute freedom, especially in the media. And particularly in this era where social media has expanded the boundaries so broadly, mm -hmm. where participation is literally uncontrolled. It's perfect competition participation. Somebody can pick a phone, walk into politics, and walk out after uh, dumping something very vitriolic in the political space. You can't even trace them. So, so you must look carefully at the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Are there any boundaries at all? Ought there to be boundaries? Should it be unbridled freedom? And, and to what end? Every system must have balance. If you don't have balance, it will tilt. And if it tilts, we will all be driven to the edge. The president, when he spoke in 2018 on media freedom, said that he preferred the rancorous and even antagonistic media to a docile one. Yes. If that's what he hoped for, and that's why he told us to be citizens and not spectators, we are being citizens now, mm. and his administration is cracking down on the media. No. Arresting journalists in the no. studios immediately after no. they are done with their shows. Arresting no. civil society groups. Your party supported so many civil society groups under the Mahama government, I can't even count them. Yet, Oliver Vomawa arrives at the airport and you bundle him up and put him in, in the cells for more than that, 30 days. That's what I'm trying to that's say. That's not human rights. That's Oliver's utterances mm -hmm. mean freedom of speech. Should we allow everybody to say what they like to undermine the security of the state. Is that what we are saying? You deal with there are through nearly the appropriate 500 structures. media outlets, formal, mm -hmm. TV, radio, we have now. There are thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of social media accounts across Facebook, Instagram, and all the other opportunities that people have. It is a very huge space. How many people have been arrested? How many out of this lot have been arrested? You have to have done something really egregious against the system. Or critical. You have to, yes, you have to have done something. It's not just criticism. City and all your affiliates are very, very critical of the government. You don't spare the government when you believe that you have policy input to make. Joy FM, who pride themselves on regime change, are very critical of us. Uh, uh, name them. You have major media stations in Accra who are extremely critical of the government. But how many people have been arrested? But when deliberate lies capable of undermining the security of the state are peddled in the name of media freedom, then the balance is tilted and one has to take action. It's not as if every day everybody is being asked not to speak their mind. There are programs where the sole object is to traduce the government. And we listen and we cringe inside, but we listen quietly. So you don't cover the civil society? Group. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Look at the vibrance of, uh, vibrancy we experienced during the debate about the new register 
in 1919, uh, uh, mm. who they didn't speak in civil society then? Who didn't speak? And yet you went ahead and did what you wanted to do. And because it's a mix. It's a the, healthy mix. The E-Levy. Everybody mm. spoke. You still went ahead with it. So they you admit that everybody yeah. can speak. In fact, they're saying that you are more dictatorial than Jerry Rawlings because when you demonstrated against Jerry Rawlings for the VAT, uh, even though he was called a dictator, uh -huh. he suspe or he was a transmogrified dictator, uh -huh. He cowered and listened and withdrew that. You have decided no. You went ahead no, with E-Levy. No. We engaged, we consulted, we spoke about it, we discussed it, we explained it. We did. Which one? The E-Levy? E okay. Uh, VAT was brought in suddenly. We didn't even appreciate the notion. And it was brought in at a very high level. So the demonstrations against it, essentially at that time, was about the misunderstanding about what it meant and the highest of levels that it was brought in at 17.5%. When it was withdrawn, sensitivity to the highest level, it was withdrawn and brought in at 10%. It was accepted. The E-Levy, we listened, we reduced the rates, we've listened very carefully, we've explained the thresholds, we've demonstrated where it will hit and where it will not hit. And we've made it very clear that it is a necessity for us as a people. And that we cannot continue to fund our development based on loans. Mm. So now, the challenge to us is to demonstrate to the people how viable that channel is and whether or not the people will come to accept it. If the people don't, the onus then will be on us and on the people to demonstrate their dislike of it in the next general election. How do you communicate for a governing party, considering that every ministry has a PRO, every minister has a personal assistant, the government has a minister for information, the presidency has a director of communication? How do you communicate for this same party? Coordination and cooperation. Is it working? It is to some extent. Mm. It's not perfect, mm. but it's a work in progress, and we are constantly at it. Mm. But clearly, uh, uh, what constitutes party primary response and what constitutes government primary response will always be an issue because the public attitude is to come to the party immediately mm -hmm. anytime mm -hmm. anything happens mm -hmm. the immediate public uh, position is to go to the party sometimes even when the party is not yet aware of, of what is at stake but like you said <laughs> the government is of the party so the party must always up its game to also meet the challenges. Mm. Do you not mm. get neglected as a party sometimes when the government becomes too popular? If the government is popular, it's about the MPP. Well, they don't see the government. They see the MPP government. Mm. Mm. So, so but do you not see, we, is we there no delineation the at a point where hardcore party people still remain at the party office and then strangers, quote unquote, are brought in to be government and then there will be a difference between or there will be a separation. You which see, separation will lead to struggle for the party that sponsored the government? It is time after eight elections in a fourth republic with two political parties who have a long tradition. It is time we appreciated the distinct rules of party, government, and the people who staff government and party. Government is a very technical thing. Party activists do not necessarily operate to staff government. Mm -hmm. But the party as an institution and organization must also always be there because it is always that organization that is there irrespective of our status, whether in government or outside government. Mm -hmm. So when we are outside government, because it is the party that is the vehicle for coming back into government, the vehicle for campaigning and otherwise, you find political activists, specialists, and to some extent policy makers, because we have to develop our policies, mm -hmm. our manifesto, mm -hmm. and we have to engage the ruling government on those policies and manifestos through the party. So you will find those uh, capacities in one. Once we fight a successful election, the technocrats tend to go into government mm -hmm. to run that technical entity, okay. which is for the entire state. Mm -hmm. Yet the party must still also remain as a viable political organization to, to run the political side of affairs. And, and, and the party strengthens itself. What I see now going forward is that because of the tendency to engage the party very quickly on any matter of policy, the party needs to strengthen its policy 
making aspects. We need to deepen our capacity to appreciate policy. So are you sure that party members truly believe and support everything the government is doing? Well, it's not possible. It's not possible that everybody, some people don't even appreciate what the government is up to. Okay. Yes, yeah, some don't even appreciate that. But mm. they have a love of politics. They believe in the party. Mm -hmm. And they believe in the government that the party has brought into being. Mm. They don't necessarily appreciate all the nuances mm -hmm. when you pass down policy. They may not necessarily appreciate all the nuances of policy. So sometimes a policy may hit somebody directly in the pocket. Well, when the government passes policy, it doesn't distinguish. The impact is not distinguished between uh, MPP and DC. Everybody. Everybody. Mm. Uh, uh, and the nature of public policy is that every time you enact a policy to solve a problem, you create a, new, a little exhaust mm, pipe mm, mm, for mm. another problem. Small which, dealt with. which later on has to be dealt with. So, so you always have a, 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 a dynamic situation mm. where people are being dealt with, they are happy, but suddenly there is unhappiness well. by virtue of the fact that a lot more are happy. This is Face to Face on City TV. My name is Omar Sandam and my guest is Yao Abina Samoa, is Director of Communications of the NPP. The party says it will break the eight. His job is to ensure that party breaks the eight. We've never had that before. It's always been eight for everybody. NDC had eight between 1992 to 2000. NPP had eight between 2001 to 2008. NDC returned 2009 to 2016. NPP came back 2017 to 2024. What happens after 2024? MPP is vowing to break the eight, a rarity. We wait to see if that happens. And I'll ask him how he's going to execute that particular campaign. Please don't worry. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, Please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free-to-air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back to Face to Face on City TV. My name is Omar Usanda. I'm here with Yao Babina Samwa, Director of Communications of the New Patriotic Party. Democracy works well when we have a parliament and a judiciary. The judiciary has been the untouched tool for all these decades, even though the soldiers have come in and removed parliament and the executive. I mean, the executive remains. Legislature goes. Judiciary, most of the time, is allowed, even if it's in some form of shape. The current judiciary that we have has come under heavy criticism. It has been tagged the unanimous FC. It has been tagged a judiciary that is voting in one favor, in one party's favor, namely the NPP. The Minister for National Security, Albert Kandapa, has had cause to say that don't give everything to, to us all the time. Share it a bit more. And I'm using this, um, um, this, this, this loosely. Do you not worry that we are losing the judiciary with these statements that are coming out targeting the justices? First of all, I am glad you say they are being criticized heavily. It means that civil society is vibrant and alive. <laughs> it's important we make that point. <laughs> okay. that, that the presumption yeah. that uh, civil society is quiescent and supporting the MPP is something that really is not the case. Mm. So if the judiciary is being attacked, then you, one realizes that we have a vibrant uh, third sector of the economy, or a larger sector of the economy where there is participation. The second thing is that every judiciary's credibility rises and falls on the quality of its judgments. If the judgments don't stand up to scrutiny, then you have issues about uh, unanimous FC or otherwise. But, but when you look at it perceptionally, and determine that, oh, it didn't go well for me, and therefore, it didn't go well once, twice, three times, or four times, and therefore, they are against me. And you don't read, you don't go into the substance, which hardly happens here. The criticism is barely on founded on, it's just on the face of it. It's not founded on the core, the substance of the judgments that are being passed. Mm. And some of the judgments that are being passed by the current court is absolutely amazing. You have to read them to understand that it's unfair. 
But that is the nature of the participatory process. That but should the justice system not make room for every party it, regardless? Okay, so it, I, don't know if this, I don't know if this is right, but shouldn't the justice system bend backwards over to accommodate other parties? Why, why should they? There are cases where the negative or rather the dissenting judgments have been that which have been taken on as the law. Mm -hmm. Cases like that have happened, and particularly at Supreme Court, Court level. Because when the Supreme Court pronounces, it is law. It is law. And, 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 and it is important because it shapes society. A democracy is shaped by law. And therefore, it is not possible when all the channels are open. You have access to appeals. You have access to uh, the Supreme Court itself. You have access to reviews by the court. And you have opportunity to criticize in the open. It, it is in that kind of ecosystem, it is very difficult to justify that the judiciary is biased against one party or that party is being shut out of the judicial system. It's not the case. Even it, access to the Supreme Court is so open that the Honorable Leonard Attorney General is proposing that they begin to specialize a bit more. That instead of taking on every case that comes before it, a very tiny procedural, technical matters and Sometimes the cases are even by way of appeal, which have been stopped at the mm. appeal court. They should rather focus on matters that are grave and, and capable of changing the law. But it is your Minister for National Security who is... I'm coming who, to who, that. ...who has spoken on I, I think I think Kandapa was taken out of context. Really? Uh, yeah, I don't think we've been fair to him. If you listen to the tape, he wasn't saying that the superior courts have been granting all decisions to the MPP. He was saying that a judicial system must be seen to be fair and unbiased, and that their judgments is that which will determine that. He cited the fact that judgments have come unanimously over the period. But he didn't say that it was that which was undermining judicial credibility. He but said that it was the duty of the courts to be unbiased. Yeah, but if he mentioned that, then that's a good reference he's making to buttress his point, he, isn't he, it? He, 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 if he's buttressing his point, that's what I'm saying. If you go back and read the substance of the decisions that have been made by the current court, the substance bears out the decisions that they have been made, that have been made. The substance of the judgments bears out the decisions that they have made. And therefore, criticism based on perception, this criticism based on face value, uh, is not fair to the court. It undermines the credibility. So of his the issue court. as Minister for National Security, how should we regard it? Well, he's, he's advised the judiciary. He was speaking to judges. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the way it is. It's, it's advice. It's not about. Uh, uh, don't forget, he was also sharing. He was actually sharing the national security strategy document mm -hmm. of the judges. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a sensitization process that's ongoing for all the various sectors of the society. I don't think it's a matter that it means we must stop there and, and disengage on all other matters. I think it's something that the judiciary will look at, uh, take on board, and, and continue that, to engage. Is that any credence in the criticism that the judiciary is in bed with the executive? Oh, I don't think so. It's always been, uh, would you call it, uh, alleged over the years, but there is always that critical case that comes up. That is the first time a national security minister is making such a statement. You no, know, I, again, I wish he would play uh, uh, his tape mm. and, and really listen and understand what he said. I don't think in nowhere in his remarks did he categorically say that they were in bed with the executive and that that link was a threat to national security. I don't think that is what he said. This is Face to Face on City TV. My name is Omar Sanda. I'm here with Yabu Abina Samoa. He's a former MP, Director of Communication, New Patriotic Party. Let's talk about your party now, the internal elections. 2024 is uh, two years, three years away, but you've started the processes. Mm. Uh, you've done your is it unit level elections, uh, polling, polling station. station level elections. And then you are preparing for the constituency elections. That's for the constituency executive. You've already done the um, electoral Coordinator. area coordinators. Yeah. And yet there's a lot of violence. violence. Your own internal party matters. <laughs> violence? Yes. <laughs> Did you see your folks butchering one of your own in Golu in the Upper you West see, Region? 
You see, every four years, we renew our party. Every four years. And this year, renewal is due. It's not just about the upcoming elections. Now, again, as politics is maturing, we are gradually weaning out the tendencies to violence. If you go back in our short history of democracy, there was a time when indeed there was lots of violence in our politics. Lots of violence. Now, comparatively, I think it's gone way down. Sometimes it breaks out. And then we will then have to punish as an example in order to kick it out entirely. Uh, uh, as recently as the Iowa West were gone by election, uh, one in line for several by elections where violence had always been reported. The president did a very fundamental political thing out of sheer political will. He compelled the two major parties to sit together and talk about political violence. It hadn't happened before. It took a lot of political will to do that. I believe, to a large extent, that that has helped to calm down violence in political systems. So, so I will not deny that there's a certain level of, of violence associated with some, but the incidence is compared to where we are coming from. Over the eight elections we have had, uh, are minimal. So we, we should be grateful? No, we should continue to educate our people and we should continue to punish so that we show that that is not the way to go. We should continue to Is punish. that not to say that your party perhaps is now becoming more violent than you have always claimed to be? I'm, I'm talking that about... That you are showing what you are really, you are really made of? No, I'm talking about comparative analysis. I'm saying that overall, mm. violence has reduced dramatically. 2020, we saw violence in the elections. It has reduced dramatically compared to uh, 2012, 20, uh, uh, Eight 1992. Eight people died in 2020. Yes, but... 2016, I, I, I how believe, many people died? I, Nobody. I believe and I insist that violence as a thematic way of resolving political disputes is on the wane. Mm -hmm. It is not in the ascendancy. But why is uh, it happening Sandra, in your internal party matters? Yes, because a lot of people join a political party uh, for various reasons. Uh, some people come into the party uh, to support aesthetically. Uh, uh, they want to be seen to be party people. Mm -hmm. Some follow they are champions into the party because they are champions elsewhere. They want to join the party and they come in. Some are continuing a tradition because an ancestor or a family member was in the party and they also decide to follow through and come into the party. Some want to be famous. So they come in and they believe that through that they will be famous. Uh, uh, some also uh, uh, come in uh, and want to take advantage of the system. They want to literally squeeze what they can get out of it. So the motivations for coming in there vary. And as it's an open democratic process, you can't control all the motivations. And therefore, you will find some people who will come in there and pursue their own narrow interests. And sometimes they do so with violence. You can't predict it. Mm. You can't mm. predict it. But I'm saying that if that happens, then it is extremely vital that the leadership of the party crack down. Which is what I was going to come to. You yes, have not been seen down. to be cracking down. Oh, we, we are. We are. We haven't heard a national statement on what happened in Golu. It, it, in it, fact, it, the accusation is that the regional minister and the regional chairman are behind it indirectly. You, you will see. You will see. We are not going to tolerate that kind of uh, uh, approach to politics. Because anymore. if it happens and it goes unpunished, it happens elsewhere and it you, keeps you know, happening. You, you know, Formina is in court. Yes. You, you are aware. Yes. The, those who painted yes. the but they, they are facing a criminal process as we speak. Mm -hmm. There's another one in uh, Mencia. They are facing a criminal process as we speak. So, so we are. We, we are going to crack but down. But could it actually seriously. not be that you are possibly imposing people on the party, which is again a problem, and people are fighting that? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying about the motivations. Mm -hmm. The different motivations. Yeah, but there, Some people a come in mm -hmm. and they want it their way and no other way. Yeah, but it's an idea that the party, either at the regional level, national level, constituency level, is imposing people. And in fact, that's something that has been said during your, so, your, so, your so, polling session elections. So, sometimes. How do you sometimes, deal with that? Sometimes those accusations are made when 
it is not even the case. Okay. Look, there were a couple of uh, uh, places. For example, Sunyani East mm -hmm. in Bono. There were demonstrations before the polling station elections when the forms had not arrived. When the date for starting the process had not arrived, there were demonstrations that the forms had arrived and been kept by somebody. Because somebody felt it in their interest to, to instigate that. that kind of thing. You, you understand? For me now, they were not even part of the process at the time. The party had said clearly that about eight constituencies were excluded from the process we were starting, including Formina. And yet, when we started the process, the people rioted in Formina because they thought that we were being denied the forms. Because they thought that you were imposing somebody on There them. was nobody being imposed because they were not even part of the process. Mm. They were not part of the police station process. They are genuinely suspicious, perhaps because they know how the workings of political parties are. There, there, there are eight constituencies that we held back. Each constituency has a different situation that we had to deal with. We have 275 constituencies. The issues within those constituencies are not even. All of them have subject to the national constitution. They all have local peculiar conditions. And this is Africa. We have ethnic situations, we have gender situations, we have geographical situations, we have endowment situations. We have all manner of situations that we are trying to use elections to resolve. And sometimes, unfortunately, elections tend to resolve it in one way, because of numbers. Mm, mm. You understand? So if you're not careful, uh, uh, you will find that every time a matter comes up in a democracy, the majority will carry it. Mm. When at the local level, there are tensions to do with that majoritarianism. I'm only using it as an yeah. example. Yeah. So, so our <laughs> party constitution actually uses the word select. And even the national constitution, when it talks about political party leaderships, we are supposed to be spread throughout the country, geographically. Is it possible that you have an election where automatically the majority will be able to select across the country geographically? Sometimes it's impossible. Mm. So we have used the position of deputies to the substantive positions to, to geographically like. balance it out, mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the constitution. So on the one hand, there is election. On the other hand, there is selection. Uh, you understand? To satisfy everybody. To satisfy everybody. So there are issues on the ground mm -hmm. that, that we need to engage beyond the superficial uh, view that we get. But clearly, there are also those who drive their personal agendas at the expense of the National Party's reputation. What's your calendar looking like? What's next? So we are doing the uh, uh, constituency uh, So executives. Constituency executive. That is... Uh, this Thursday. Uh, yes, 28th mm -hmm. to the 2nd May. Thursday to Sunday. All constituencies? Except those we exempted okay. earlier. So okay. majority of the constituencies. So, so constituencies can select any day within the 28th to the 2nd to have their election. Who, who supervises the election? The Electoral Commission. Okay, not the regional, but the regional... They will be there. So they run it? They, they run it, but the Electoral Commission supervises okay. under the Political Parties Act. So there will be a ballot box, ballot papers, you vote for whoever? Yes. Okay. Everything. Will, will how be. many candidates per constituency? Or how many people oh, do you... Uh, Everybody is entitled to pick forms. But as we speak, vetting has been done. Mm. So the people who are qualified to run have been approved. And they've been campaigning? They are campaigning seriously. How many people come out of it? That's what I meant. How many executives? Oh, ten, ten elected persons per constituency. You have a chairman of the constituency, first vice chairman, second vice chairman, uh, secretary, assistant secretary, uh, treasurer, uh, organizer, uh, women organizer, youth organizer, and a national coordinator. For every constituency? Every constituency. So ten? Ten. Then you're going to, so you're going to have 275 times 10 executives when you are done when with your election. Okay. And, then, and, and then we appoint seven as deputies. Oh, so to, to, which, to, to which of the positions? Uh, all uh, the positions? Uh, not all. Uh, the chairman already has two deputies. So, First vice secretary. So elected. deputy secretary. So the deputy organizer. The deputy secretary is also elected. elected. So we have a deputy uh, organizer. organizer. We have a deputy women's organizer. We have a deputy youth organizer. We have a financial secretary okay. to support the treasurer. the treasurer. We have a communications officer. 
and then we have a research and elections officer. So that makes it 17. Yes. Those are the people you work with at the constituency level. That's right. They would be the basis or the college that will be voting for regional executives, correct? Yes. Okay, but who is voting for them now? The polling station executive. Those who, who were elected. Have, okay. Uh, and the electoral area coordinators. I see. Yes, so that is the current level. So and then the existing, pool. And then the existing, uh, in every constituency, you have uh, five council of patrons and five council of elders. So they will also vote. And then anybody who is a founding member of the party. Who is in the constituency? Who is in the constituency? The founding members are very limited. They are finite. Yeah. The members who signed the very first uh, registration document with the Electoral Commission in 1992, uh, who put their necks on the line of Rollins. You started by asking me how the environment was. <laughs> that was when chairman was chairman. So they are going extinct <laughs> by Gradually. the years. Gradually. Which means by the time, I don't know, I'm not going to predict Gradually. someone's death. I see. Okay, so that's a very wide pool, but you have a more restrictive pool for the regional elections. When is the regional elections happening? Um, end of May, 27th. No, May. May to the, yes, that's when you're May. going to have your original executives. Yes. I see. Wh why the speed? No, it's four weeks. Election is in 2024. No, it's not about the 2024 the election. Run the it's about renewing the party. Mm -hmm. The party has to set itself up structure itself, and then go ahead to organize the parliamentary primaries and the presidential primaries. The this, party has a lot of work to do. These constituency executives you are choosing, mm. uh, they are not supposed to be supportive of any candidate, are they? They are not. They are not. They're supposed to be neutral supporters of NPP, yes. only blue and white and red. That's right. But that's just on the face of it. Behind the scenes, they are actually representing candidates who have interest. And of course, they, they will, they will they, vote for they will, candidates. They will vote for candidates. <laughs> then you have a regional election in May 27. These people, so the yeah, executive... May 27 to 29. So the constituency executive will go and choose these people. Is yeah. there any other person in part of their college? Yeah, yes. It's, it's, it's a fairly large college. Okay. Uh, off the top of my head. Uh, it's in the constitution. Okay. I'd rather not uh, go uh, okay. mention it and then miss... So uh, after May 27, out. when you get your regional executives, what happens? And then we'll go for the national election which at the moment is uh, slated for mid-June. Mid-June. But uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, could vary. Are regional executives or hopefuls allowed to start campaigning now? Regional executives? Hopefuls. Uh, they are campaigning, I'm sure. Yeah, but... but Officially. I, I want to be it sure... It will be immediately after the... Constituency. constituency election. Which means that even the national executives are also not allowed to be campaigning no. officially yet. No. So after that, in June, did you say June? Yes. You have it in June. Uh, July. July. Yes, July. Sorry. Then when do you go for your flag bearership? Uh, the, the new executive uh, steering committee, national executive committee, will develop a timetable which national council will endorse. Your constitution has some rule about whether you're in position or in government, how much time you need to elect a candidate. Does that apply now? Uh, yes, it does. In so, government, not later than 11 months. Okay. And in opposition, not later than 18 months. I see. Which means you still have a lot of time to work oh, yes. with. Okay. Are you going to run for any of the positions? Uh, executive this, positions? This, this year, no. Oh, you're not going to run for national executive positions? <laughs> no. Your position currently is appointed. Yes. You are appointed to be director of communication. That's right. But you can run for a position. I can. You won't go for general secretary? No. You won't go for treasurer? No. Why you do you want me to go for trade? No, I, look, I look like you somebody who can mobilize money. You, you need money, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I look like somebody who can mobilize yeah, money. I mean, you're, you're out of parliament. You need money to possibly go back and run. It would not be my money. Mm. <laughs> to, mm. to be the party's money. But talking about that, I'll come and talk about identity constituency later to find out what your interests are, how you're working there. But let's talk about breaking the eight. You yeah. want to break the eight as a political party. So these people are all helping you set the stage for breaking the eight. Yes. But really and truly, why should someone living in Fafaha in your constituency in Adenta vote for the MPP to continue after eight years? Eight years of economic challenges, eight years of increases at the fuel station, eight years of a city that is galloping, eight years of, I mean, plenty of other things. I am convinced we will break the eight. And I am convinced because I sense a growing maturity within the Ghanaian voter population. Mm -hmm. Eight elections heading into our ninth election. It's a watershed for the Ghanaian voter. Records-wise, it is clear that any time the MPP has been in power, we bring forward innovative programs that invest in the people effectively. 
And then when the NDC comes, they are unable to sustain these improvements. And so that back and forth, the eight-year cycle, which seems to have served us so far, is ripe for a break because it is creating a disservice in the political process. It is not making politics sustainable. In other words, it's not making good politics sustainable. Now, where we sit now as a party and as a government, on all the indices, we believe that this government has done far better than the NDC could have done, in spite of the challenges, and that the NDC is not the solution. Unemployment, the NDC is not the solution. The NDC's solution for employment is the IMF, which we know famously will cut down on investments uh, so that you can use the money to pay off your debts. So if we are generating employment through the health sector, through education, through the security services, uh, through the public services, through agriculture, and we are expanding spaces through entrepreneurship development, and you believe that it's not fast enough for you, your, your, your refuge cannot be the NDC. Well, the NDC cannot even keep up with what we are doing. Your, your need is to help us to accelerate what we are doing. Secondly, we believe that we are better positioned to appreciate the current modern challenges of public finance and economics. Well, if you don't sit back to look at what is happening in the world, you will realize that the old ideological way of dealing with economics is being dumped. Because how do you cut back on public debt by cutting down on services to the people when the people need to be supported with subsidies because of the international environment. The prices are rising. Food prices are rising. Uh, uh, energy prices are rising. So who are hardest hit when those things happen? The vulnerable, those who are already suffering. Now, if those people, the programs that support those people are based on public debt, public investment, and then you are asked to cut down on public investment in order to reduce debt, in order to balance your books, then what you are saying is that whole populations are going to starve. And that is why the IMF and the World Bank are beginning to think outside the box. And the IMF president, and the World Bank president is now saying that, and the IMF already did it during COVID. The president is now saying that he's going to create a fund, uh, 150 million, billion dollars, in order to support vulnerable countries who are suffering from the three things sweeping the entire world now, the policy instruments for which are not adequate. The pandemic, it implies a reduction of revenues. It means people cannot work and pay their taxes, but an expansion of public expenditure because those people have to be taken care of, even though they are not paying any taxes. Then you go to rising inflation. The, the normal reaction to inflation is to increase uh, uh, the cost of capital. <laughs> Am I correct? Then, and that's a local problem that you are not able to deal with. It's not it's international. Not, it, it's not, who told you? Mm. Go to the UK and go to the other uh, 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 world, powerful world economies. They are, expect, they are experiencing the highest rises in inflation for 40 years and 30 years. If you produced enough, you will not have a challenge with inflation. Who produces more than the US? They have their own domestic challenges. Exactly. So, yeah. so we all have domestic challenges. And the international habitat of those domestic challenges, the World Bank and the IMF, are saying that three things are driving those domestic challenges. And the third one is the, the Ukraine the war. The Ukraine war. And Russia is saying, don't blame them for the because hunger Russia in the... Russia must in... defend itself. No, Russia... Russia is saying that you already had your problems. Don't blame us. If you, you are not you doing your that... operation, feed yourself. You, and you want to blame... Do you, them, know, do you know that Russia doesn't even call it a war? Yes, they don't call it a war. Thank you. But it's so a war. why is the rest of us calling it a war? But it's an invasion, isn't it a war? No, they don't even call it an invasion. They call it an oppression. It's an oppression. So they, they are in denial. So if <laughs> Russia they, so is if in they, denial. So if they deny the food aspect, we should, we, should not take, we should not take their word for it. That's, that's why I'm saying that the, the metrics for managing these situations are entirely different from the old-fashioned okay. orthodox ways. Right, right. And we, the MPP government, are in a good place okay. to appreciate those things and support the people to ride over the current challenges. This is Face to Face on CDTV. Yaw Babina Samoa, we call him YB, he's my guest. When we come back, I ask him about the failed 
bid to return to parliament from Adenta, whether he still has a plan and how he's going to execute that if there is any such plan. Don't worry. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. You're welcome back to Face to Face. My guest is a former member of Parliament of Adenta. You serve two terms or one term? Oh, just one term. Oh, one term, and they threw you away. Uh, well, Adenta is a one term. That is actually true. One yeah. of the most uh, Ashawo constituencies in town. <laughs> you call it Ashawo, they will not be amused. Okay, I withdraw Ashawo <laughs> and say one of the unfaithful constituencies. Is that fine? Which is worse than Ashawo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, since the history, <laughs> has there any, been anyone who ever repeated? No. You either lose at the general election or lose in the primaries. The primary, yes. Oh. Hmm. You, you, you lost at the general election? Yes. Oh, how has it been so far for you in opposition? Um, I, I Must have been shocking or you really were in opposition. I'm part of the ruling government ah, and government. I'm part of the national party structure. If you so had won at Denta, you would not be having all those problems you have in parliament with uh, Adria Safo's absence. You would have been fine. Comfortable, if, smooth if, if we had beaten the incumbency disease of losing seats, uh, you remember there was a tsunami Mm -hmm. for the NDC yeah. some time ago yeah. and then we also suffered it you know but yours is worse than 40, yes. 40, 41 uh, and recovered 17 from them in, I think it's 42 we lost yeah, but yours, yours is bad in greater Accra region look at how you've been walloped Afro Central region is horrible the, the it's almost like your parliament the, the conditions the conditions again uh, that's what I was speaking to about beginning to analyze our economic challenges properly in order for the people to appreciate that it's a beginning and a continuation and that you are not going to be able to get what you need and what you desire with substart political processes. We are at the point where good programs must be sustained mm. and therefore the parties which bring in good programs must be voted for to keep those programs going. They tweak them, they enhance them, but then they work for your benefit okay. and that is what breaking the aid is about mm, mm. but the things we have started look at the coastal communities 12 landing beaches mm, yes. with all the facilities but they are suffering from high tide yes some areas are and, and you again neglect, and you neglected them no it's a process like i said we have to invest in debt to put all those things up and mm. there's a limit to debt mm. so so we as a government are the same people who are fighting to restructure capital expenditure revenue resources for capital expenditure, water down the debt aspect and try and raise money internally. The e-levy is a good start. Mm. The expansion of the tax base with the changeover of the national ID card mm. to a TIN number mm -hmm. is a major, major one. Because currently, at the same level of taxes per individual, you can collect more. Okay. That's the national and general picture. Let's talk yes. about the Adenta picture. How are you looking as a party in Adenta? Do you look the, like the, you can the, reclaim this? The thing? national reorganization is ongoing, and, and Adenta is calm. My reports show that they are doing well. You look like you can recover, Adenta. The, you can reclaim the Adenta. Seat. Yes. Uh, that's what my reports tell me. No, you as a person. I'm referring to MPP That's first, what my reports tell me. That you are doing good. Yes. Okay, what have you done? What infrastructure, major infrastructure uh, deployment have you done the, to merit the, every... The, the, a lot of the stuff that was done when I was there, in the first term, has come to light now, okay. uh, particularly roads, okay. uh, security, uh, playing fields, uh, access to education, you know. But, but the biggest part of it has been the infrastructure. So these are your legacies? Yes, more or less. What is wrong with Adenta currently? Why should there be a change of a candidate of an MP? Because I believe the current MP cannot continue <laughs> with what he was bequeathed. <laughs> how, he, he slowed down. How? And no new infrastructure is coming. All the infrastructure ongoing, a continuation of the things that. Because happened. his party is not in power. Uh, 
Yeah, but then, then why would you continue with that? If yeah, the but party he's is hoping not that we're going to break the eight, mm. <laughs> then we keep him. Mahama is on the sidelines, jogging. Jogging. But really? he has no program. How? Mama doesn't have a program. Mama doesn't actually appreciate the challenges he's coming to face, assuming, without admitting, that he may even uh, 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 win an election. I doubt if he can. He has no policy. No policies whatsoever. He has a one-track policy, IMF. And the IMF itself is changing its mind about public finances. But we have his manifesto of 2020. Finances. We saw the things he has oh, in there. Uh, uh, when the NDC produces a manifesto, please read it backwards and, and sideways. One-time premium manifestos. For any then time. you see manifestos are always about promises they can't keep. One-time premium policy manifestos. That was the only thing they failed in. You see, John Mahama and his daily utterances must first of all appreciate the challenges we have as a nation. He has. He said you push to admit that there's a problem. But isn't there a problem worldwide? He wants us to admit a Ghana problem without the international dimension. John Mahama wants us to focus on a Ghana pre-COVID and a Ghana post-COVID. He said you use the COVID money to run your elections. <laughs> and, and, and when the have diverted uh, 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 when the register brand new register was underwritten by the, the entire government solely the entire cost solely by the government it's never happened before and then the election itself underwritten by the government solely without uh, 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 donor uh, benefit of donor funding this is the very first time it's happened in Ghana so is that where the money went to I am not in a position to break down money from beginning to end but I think your mama should respect the statutory requirements but for you chopped, public accountability. He, he, said you chopped the he can say anything. That's the point I'm making. The things he says don't advance the arguments. Mm. The things he says avoid the facts. The things he says refuse to admit that the pandemic is impacting Ghana, that Ukraine Russia is impacting Ghana, that international rises in commodity prices are impacting Ghana. That you are blaming everything on the international world by yourselves. But IMF that he believes in. The IMF is John Mohammed's uncle, brother, father, mother, and the World Bank. They are saying that those three cages are impacting African economies negatively. Will lawyer Boabina Samoa run for Adenta again? That's a matter for the gods to determine. Oh, no, the gods are here. There's one of them <laughs> sitting here. No, this, yeah. There's only one god. Yeah. No, but you said gods. You didn't say god. So the gods. This is, this is your elephant god with the baby gods. What are they telling you? The elephant your, your is the new patriotic party. Yes. And the new patriotic party has a way of determining those things. So you are not going to, you have not decided on whether you want to run. In your heart. I remember when Akufado said there was enough fire in his belly to run in 2020, uh, 2016. He has been a great leader for our party. Will you Still run? Still is. For Adenta. Let us know. Be bold. Be bold? I'm very bold. Yes. Yes. Will you run for Adenta? Are you afraid of running again in Adenta? Are you cash trapped? <laughs> Is there something like political strategy? Yes. Let's that, see what happens. That's why you're deploying. Let's see what happens. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Lawyer Yao Boabe Asamo, former anti-corruption crusader. Ten Still. Oh, how? Yeah, I, no, I don't think so. Why are you assuming poli all politicians are corrupt? Oh, you're not? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative assumption. It's part of the stereotyping that is you as a person, that are, You as a person, are you corrupt? The, <laughs> 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 we need to go. <laughs> Don't answer that question. It's over. This has been face to face. My name is Umaru Sandamado. Thank you for watching City TV.